Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to Criminal Justice. I am Dr. Clay. Today, we are looking at the structure and the functions of corrections. So when you think of modern era development of punishment, it's been quite a journey, we should say. So historically, as society developed, so too did our punishments. So what we would have is we would have very harsh sanctions for even minor crimes that often resulted in corporal punishment, right? So corporal punishment means hitting of the body. So this included branding people as criminal, whipping them in public, pillory, banishment, and again, that's how Australia formed. Uh, English sent their prisoners to Australia and they had to work on boats and that's all they did. And then slavery, right? So slavery is, is under the 14th Amendment still legal in the United States, as long as slavery is directed towards people who have been or who are serving sentences in, in prison. Um, you can essentially make them a slave which is really upsetting. And Colorado last year was the first state to abolish every kind of slavery, including prison slavery. That being said, we're talking about the development of punishments. The development of the death penalty was also super creative. Uh, so they had everything from drawing and quartering someone, burning people at the stake, Dissection, breaking at the wheel, the Iron Maiden, and so on and so forth. Right, so breaking at the wheel is basically they strapped you on a wheel with spikes and then they just turned the wheel until they hit the ground. Um, Iron Maiden, it looked like a sarcophagus. And what it did is it had the, the door had these giant metal spikes that stuck out. And all the executioner had to do was put the prisoner in the, the, the sarcophagus and close the door. And that would kill the prisoner because all the spikes would go into him. So we got creative. Now, that being said, modern societies tend to rely upon incarceration instead of corporal punishment or instead of the death penalty via jails Jail is anyone awaiting trial or anyone serving less than a year's sentence. And we rely on prisons. Prisons are for anybody who is serving over one year sentence. Now, however, barbaric punishments are still common in some areas, or some eras. For instance, uh, the example I'll give you is stoning to death or mutilation. These are prescribed under some interpretations of Sharia law for certain offenses. Right, so if you're in Iran, you can be stoned to death for certain offenses. Um, different parts of Africa, different dictators um, have different stances on genital mutilation for females and things along those lines. So I wanted to give you a comparative example of what I mean when I say we are different. Right? The United States is, is, is different in how we do things, um, but there are still some barbaric ways of going about it. So that being said, I'm going to show a short video, and then we'll jump back in talking about the structure of corrections.
least once in their life. In the United States, about 655 people per 100,000 are sent to jail. This disparity between incarceration rates may make you think that Japan has a better prison system and therefore a more humane form of death row. You might be shocked at what we uncover as we explore the death row practices of Japan and compare them to the US. Death row is the term given to the time from when someone is convicted and sentenced to death until the execution date. Let's start by looking at how Japan and the United States differ in the sentencing of prisoners who end up on death row. In the United States, a person who is arrested has the right to remain silent and an attorney present during questioning. If you're not using RIG for project management and team collaboration, questioning. This may seem normal to a lot of us, but that's not the case in Japan. When questioned in Japan, the accused is not allowed representation. They may remain silent, but as we'll see, this tends not to work out. In Japan, police can keep suspects in custody for up to 23 days without evidence. There have been reports of Japanese police torturing suspects, both mentally and physically, to get a confession. It wasn't until 2016 that Japan instituted a mandatory video recording of interrogations. Unfortunately for the suspect, this only applies to 3% of Japan's criminal cases. The only interrogations that are recorded are for serious charges such as murder. All other interrogations are done in secret. In contrast, the United States justice system requires that there be a third party present during questioning of a suspect. The prisoner can waive their right to counsel, but this is rare. Even in these uncommon cases without a lawyer present, the interrogations are still monitored. One main reason for this is to keep police from forcing a confession using unreliable methods. The United Nations and other human rights advocates have concluded through numerous studies that confessions through torture and inhumane practices are almost never reliable. Unfortunately, the Japanese criminal justice system does not see it that way. Iwao Hakamata was arrested and later convicted for the murders of several people in Japan. He claimed he was subjected to more than 240 hours of questions over 20 days. There were no video recordings of the interrogation process, so we'll never know what actually happened during that time. However, the amount of time Hakamata spent in custody is undeniable. Iwao was one of the few who appealed his death sentence and was granted a hearing, but the hearing never came. For five decades, Iwao sat in solitary confinement on death row, making him the longest serving death row inmate ever. Recently, his sister, with the support of various legal organizations, convinced the district court to order a retrial. The district court decided to free Iwao to await his retrial at home. He was released from prison due to his fragile mental state after spending almost 50 years on death row. Unfortunately, Iwao is still waiting for his retrial, and if found guilty a second time, he could go back to prison. Until then, Iwao sits at home, waiting to see if he'll become a free man or return to death row. In the United States, as in most democracies, confessions obtained after more than 200 hours of interrogation are ruled as involuntary, unreliable, and cannot be used as evidence in court. This is not the case in Japan, which may be why the country has a 99% conviction rate. When there is someone arrested for a crime and a confession is secured by police, regardless of the means, that person is guilty. The evidence against them may be shoddy and they may have been tortured, but that does not stop the state from convicting them. Prosecutors tend to only pursue cases they think will lead to a guilty verdict. This is practically everyone who is brought to court. Since crime rates are so low in Japan, someone who is brought to court is already assumed to be guilty. Jurors automatically assume they've committed the crime even before hearing the evidence. This leads to an easy conviction and a high conviction rate. The United States also has a high conviction rate. In the US, conviction rates have risen over the decades and are currently around 90%. However, only Japan can boast a conviction rate of 99%. With higher conviction rates, are there higher execution rates in Japan than the US? The most recent data from Japan reports that 24 people were executed between 2012 and 2016. However, since 1977, the annual number of executed inmates has never been more than 9 people in a year. In 1998, the Japanese Justice Ministry released a report that stated seven people were executed in one week, which was the largest number of executions in that amount of time. Regardless of how you feel about the death penalty, the United States execution rates are startling. In 2018 alone, 25 death row inmates were executed. That's more than Japan executes in three years. In 2019, 22 prisoners were executed in the US. This is just two less than all of the executions in Japan between 2012 and 2016. Japan may have a higher conviction rate than the US, but the US executes many more prisoners than Japan does. This may be shocking, but there is of course also a massive population difference between the two nations, meaning more criminals in one than the other, and thus more capital punishment. Once convicted and sent to death row, do inmates have any rights? 
In the US, there are human rights organizations that monitor the conditions for inmates on death row. Almost all of these human rights organizations agree that the death penalty and the preceding trial violate the prisoner's rights. And it's not just inmates on death row that have it hard. These conditions for regular prisoners in the US can be harsh. If you don't believe us, watch any of the other infographic show videos on prisons. I think you'll be surprised at what you find. In Japan, things are a little more tricky when it comes to basic rights. Like in the United States, death row inmates can appeal to the Supreme Court for another hearing. Unfortunately for the inmates in Japan, just because you appeal does not guarantee you won't be executed before your case can be heard. There are multiple accounts of prisoners who requested retrials and were executed while waiting to hear back about pending court dates. The law in Japan says that the execution must take place within six months of the court's decision. In reality, the executions take years, but just because you have a pending retrial does not mean you're protected from being executed in Japan. One problem that plagues both countries' death row inmates is that many suffer from mental illness. This factor is often overlooked, and when these prisoners are put in isolation, their conditions can deteriorate rapidly. Both Japan and the US keep death row prisoners in solitary confinement until it's time for their execution. These harsh conditions of isolation… This is Mongolia, and we are not them. The only company weigh heavily on older inmates. For this population, solitary confinement can lead to an increase in physical disabilities, causing excruciating pain for older inmates. Two of the most profound differences between death row in Japan and in the US are the date and the way prisoners are executed. In the United States, execution dates are set in advance. This is considered to be better for the inmates' mental stability. Japan, on the other hand, does not give predetermined execution dates. Instead, inmates on death row in Japan could be executed at any point after being sentenced. Many don't find out they're to be executed until the morning of their capital punishment. This often leaves inmates with only about an hour or two to prepare themselves for what's to come. The UN Committee Against Torture has criticized Japan for this practice. The psychological strain of not knowing when the execution will occur is literal torture, not only to the inmate, but to their families as well. It is true that the United States prisoners do get a request a last meal. Some prison systems honor everything an inmate asks for, but others do not. Either way, death row prisoners do get a final meal. Since there's no set date of execution in Japan, inmates do not get a final meal on the day they're to be executed. If you had to guess right now, which country do you think would have a more humane execution? Would it be Japan with their surprise executions or the United States with its high number of executions? Is one way better than the other? We'll let you be the judge. In Japan, executions are carried out by hanging. The inmate is blindfolded and a black hood is placed over their head before they're executed. To release the executioners of their burden, three prison officers simultaneously press the button for the trap door to open. This way, they'll never know which button pusher was ultimately responsible for taking the prisoner's life. In the United States, things work a little differently. Most often, the prisoner is executed by lethal injection. The deadly cocktail varies by state, but normally it consists of some form of paralytic before a final poison is administered. This is often done by people without any medical training. It makes sense when you think about it as administering the chemicals to kill someone would be in breach of a medical professional's Hippocratic Oath. But unlike in Japan, the person who is carrying out the execution knows without a doubt they are the ones who delivered death to the inmate. Also unlike Japan, the United States allows execution methods to be determined at the state level rather than having one standard federal policy. Some states even allow the executee to choose their method of execution. States like Alabama and Tennessee in the United States allow their prisoners to choose which method they'd like to die from. This led to some inmates asking for execution by electric chair. The electric chair was discontinued after it became considered more humane to use chemicals to kill a prisoner. This could be because the outward appearance of someone being cooked alive by electricity is less desirable than a prisoner that quietly drifts off to sleep and then dies. But in states that allow prisoners to choose their form of execution, several have opted to go by electric chair. Another form of execution that prisoners in the US have chosen to die by is firing squad. In 2010, Ronnie Lee Gardner was killed by firing squad in Utah. Is it more humane to let someone decide how they'll be executed? Maybe, but if you take into consideration the mental health of prisoners, it's probably not. One of the most surprising differences between the death row in Japan and in the United States has to do with the general population. 
Japan has a much higher support rate for the death penalty than the US. 80% of Japanese citizens support the death penalty, whereas in 2018, only 54% of United States citizens support the death penalty. Even if you disagree with the way Japan carries out executions, the majority of Japanese citizens do not. The differences between death row in Japan and death row in the US are clear. What is less clear is if one is better than the other, or if there should be a death row at all. In 2019, Japan approved a decision to stop using the death penalty by 2020. Huge amounts of pressure were put on them by human rights organizations, including the United Nations, to abolish the death penalty before Japan hosted the Olympic Games. The resolution was submitted to the heads of the government in Japan. The death penalty has still not been abolished, but to be fair, the United States has hosted the Olympics several times in the past, most recently in 2002, yet the United States still uses the death penalty. Apparently, not getting rid of death row to host the Olympics is something Japan and the US have in common. For more prison facts, watch 50 insane facts about prison you won't believe. Or for an in-depth look at what it's actually like to be a death row inmate, check out what the last 24 hours of death row prisoners look like. When school is So that kind of gives you an idea of, of the differences between uh, Japan and the United States in terms of how we go about executing people, right? Um, there, we'll have a whole uh, couple of classes on the death penalty, but the question is, you know, is it barbaric? Um, you can make a case for either one being barbaric, or you could make a case for either one not being barbaric, right? But yeah, it, 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 Japan's execution system is really interesting. Um, because what they didn't talk about is sometimes in Japan, you can be executed with um, uh, just a shot to the back of your head. Like they, they, you go into a room, there's a drain, and they shoot you. Um, sometimes the guards like to screw with the people on death row, and they'll open their cell like they're going to be executed, take them into the room, put the noose around their neck, and then call it off or take them into the room where they shoot them and pull the trigger right next to their head. So like they think they're dying, they're not, and they take them back and put them in death row. Um, there is no line in terms of death row in Japan. So if you get sentenced to be executed, you can be executed that day or 50 years later, right? Uh, and in the United States, we do have a similar system but that's because appeals are going through the process and we cannot execute someone until all appeals have been exhausted. Japan, as you heard, they don't care. Uh, if there is an appeal, doesn't matter. It does not stop the death penalty. So again, we're talking about industrialized Western nations. Japan and, and the United States have taken different paths in terms of how we execute but the, the fact remains that we still do execute, right? So again, you can debate the, the, the merits of death penalty during my death penalty class or during the, this course when we talk about the death penalty and go from there. So how do we get to this ideology facilitating modern era development? So pre-1700s, Correctional practices in Europe and America varied, but shared similar goals. Punish offenders, reduce crime, and protect society. Specifically, these sanctions were focused on a punishment ideology, right? So the more you punish, the better you punish, the more likely it is that you're going to reduce crime and protect society. However, the Age of Enlightenment changes the focus of corrections from punishment Reformation. So this is where we see a fight against cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, in the United States, we see faith becoming a guiding concept, largely influenced by Puritan beliefs. And so, it, and it's still true to this day, uh, it just looks a little bit different. But if you think about it, uh, or if you've ever heard of it, most prisons are called penitentiaries, right? Federal penitentiary. Well, the penitentiary derives from the Puritan belief of penance, 
to God for sins and crimes. And so what the Puritans would do is they would lock you in a cell with a Bible, and that's it, until you were spiritually redeemed and reformed in their eyes. Then you could rejoin society, right? Now, today, you're locked in a cell. You might get a Bible if you can get one from the library. Um, and you do various other things in, in the prison until we've deemed it that you have been redeemed or reformed um, or that your time has expired and we'll really shoot back into society. So it brings us to the classical school of criminology, right? Now we've talked about this before. So the reformist principles of the Enlightenment philosophers emphasized self-determination and individual responsibility. And so this, ide this ideology was later referred to as the classical school of criminology. And, and one of the philosophers, one of the most famous, the, the father of modern um, criminology, Caesar Beccaria, uh, who advocated focusing on crime prevention, limiting the severity of punishment, proportionality, and making crime or making punishments swift and certain. As a result, what happened is, is, is predicated upon these Puritan beliefs, we started using imprisonment as a punishment way more than we did in the past, right? And the idea here is, well, there's gonna be prevention, the person is responsible for their actions, um, but it shouldn't be too severe. We shouldn't kill everyone for every minor offense. So jails started going up, proportionality, you did X, so proportionately we should do X number of units of harm to you. So basically the classical school of the Puritan beliefs merged and created the modern day correctional system at both the federal and the state levels. So let's talk about the federal correctional system. The federal correctional system houses individuals convicted of federal criminal law violations. The first federal penitentiaries were authorized in 1891 and operated with little central oversight or control. As a result, federal penitentiaries went off the rails. I mean, we're talking horrible conditions, horrible, horrible conditions, no plumbing, no anything like that. Like, I mean, really bad conditions. As a result, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and there's a link that you can click on to get to it, was established in 1930. And what it did, it established graded systems of institutions, right? So basically severity of how, the severity of the institution. The Bureau of Prisons operates integrated systems of over 100 facilities. Federal Bureau of Prisons houses over 210,000 inmates. And if we look at the Federal Bureau of Prisons population, they're primarily young, disproportionately black, minimally educated, and young. Half of all federal inmates are between the ages of 18 and 34. So this is just a map of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, where things are located. Um, basically, anywhere you see a circle is a federal correctional institution where you see a triangle is a United States penitentiary, um, where you see a triangle that doesn't, is not filled in, that's a federal medical center. All right, and you can see that they're kind of spread out, right? And, and California has a lot of them, Connecticut has a lot of them. Um, New York doesn't have too many, it only has like two. Um, but you can see how we kind of spread these things out to be kind of near population centers, but also kind of away from them. So I grew up in Lebanon, Missouri. I went to college in Springfield, Missouri. So if you look on the map in Missouri, Springfield, Missouri had the Federal Medical Center. Uh, this was for patients or for prisoners. The, the, the government has to provide, has to take care of prisoners um, who had cancer. Right, they needed chemotherapy, they would go there. Um, they needed dialysis, they would go there. It also housed the federal psychiatric ward. Uh, and as much as I dislike doing tours of prisons, because I think it's, it's inhumane in and of itself, 
um, that was a very shocking thing to see. Uh, the, the state of federal medical facilities when it comes to um, mental health. That is difficult to see. Um, and what we're going to end up seeing is if, if, if you look at the, the box with a C uh, in Colorado, that's where the supermax, su super maximum security prison is at the federal level, right? So this is where basically death row is, even though we don't execute people here in Colorado, we execute people in Terre Haute, Indiana, right? So Colorado is where your death row is, and then you get flown via Con Air to Terre Haute, and that's where the death chamber is. Um, so thinking about people serving sentences in super maximum security prison, you have Ted Kaczynski, um, you have the Boston Marathon bomber, you have like kind of like the worst of the worst, right? Now not all are awaiting death, most are. Um, they have absolutely no human interaction, none whatsoever. Right? The meals are all delivered to them. They don't have windows. They, don't, they have no human interaction, right? And it's called, and it's led me to, to question whether or not that is cruel and unusual punishment, especially considering they have death over their heads as well. And like we learned in the video, most prisoners have some kind of mental illness. So if we want to look at the total number of prisoners in the federal population from 1975 to 2010, you see a trend, right? It's skyrocketing. These are a number of prisoners per 100,000 people in the population. Right? And that trend has just it has continued all the way through modern day of more and more and more prisons and prisoners. This is because Federal, well, largely, federal law has focused and federal law enforcement has focused on drugs, which, again, the, it, it's, you can have that debate yourself. Um, but because they focus on drugs, they put people in these prisons and think that drugs don't come into the prisons. They absolutely do. Um, and so there's also some other things that, that, that kind of predicated the growth of federal prison population, right? So 1975, we're talking nobody, there was, there was hardly anybody, right, um, in prison, or in federal prison, I should say. State prisons look a lot different, but federal prisons, not so much. And it's because we didn't have that many federal criminal laws, right? So theoretically, to this day, we don't have a law, a federal law, against murder. Now, you, there is a law against murdering a federal employee, but if I just went over and shot my neighbor, the feds have no law to touch me. The state of New York would touch me, but not the feds. What we see is kind of from 1975 all the way through 2010 to this day is the escalation of the rhetoric of get tough, um, we have the unbelievably failed drug policies of the 1980s. Um, we, we just see this tremendous growth, right? In terms of what laws Congress passes that says we can have jurisdiction over. So if we look at the federal prison population demographics, this is 2010. So 93% of all federal prisoners are men, 7% are women. Race, 35% are white, 38% are black, 21% are Hispanic, and 6% count for all others. So if you're white and black, it's not looking good for, excuse me, if you're men and black, it's not looking good for you. Then we look at age. Age is relatively proportionate. Um, except 18 to 19 year olds is a very small gap. But if you see it, it's very proportionate. Um, 20 to 24, 18 to 20, or 25 to 29, 30 to 34, right? That makes up half. That's the argument right now is half of all federal prisoners are under the age of 35, right? Well, to be fair, the other half are over the age of 35, right? So that being said, if you are a man 
you are black and you are under the age of 35, things are really not looking good for you. And then we look at education. So 35% of federal prisoners have more than 12 years, 12 years or more of education, which just means they graduated high school, maybe went to college. 65% never made it to a college graduation or a high school graduation. They never got the GED, anything along those lines. All right, so if we take it, this, this kind of aspect, if you're male, you're black, you're young, and you don't have an education, federal prison with demographics would suggest that um, you would fit in very well, which is upsetting, right? We should see proportionality among um, age groups, among race, among gender, to that of society, if we're doing it correctly. Because we know, generally speaking, every gender, every race, every age, they, they commit crime basically at the same rates, right? And so to say that there's 35% of people in federal prison who are white, and they're the majority in the country, but 38%, so three more uh, percentage points, 38% are black, while they represent a significant minority in the country, they're still a minority. Um, in prison, they're the majority, right? So it's, it's, it's a very interesting map. And it's gonna be really interesting to compare to the state maps, right? Because states tend to look a little different. Um, gender is still the same. Race is roughly the same. It's a little bit more equal. Age is skewed and education is skewed. So on that note, let's talk about the state and local correctional systems. So each state has its own correctional system that houses individuals convicted of state criminal law violations. Generally, the structure is very similar to the federal level, but tends to be much, much, much more dangerous, right? So if we think of like the federal system, there were three murders of like last year, that was it, the whole federal system. And they were all gang related. If we look at the Hill, right, there were three murders on the Hill last year, and that's just one prison. So if you ever get the choice between going to federal prison and going to state prison, always choose federal prison, right? They much more updated, they're a lot nicer than state prisons. State prisons are rough. Now, each state system is unique. So I gave you a link here. That's to the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. So that's the official title for New York Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Um, so if you see somebody that says they work for the DCCS, that just means that they are probably a prison guard or they work in some kind of administrative capacity. That being said, that's the states. Jails and detention centers are generally located at the local level. Right, so when we think about jails, recall it's for people who are awaiting trial or who've been convicted and they're serving a short sentence of less than a year. Or it also includes now offenders awaiting a bed in state or federal prison. Right, so I could, you could, be, you could I could convict somebody and I, I could sentence, sentence them to 25 years to life in prison. And guess where they're going to go right after that? Downstairs back into the jail, where you have a guy who's there for a DUI, or you have a guy who's there for petty larceny, and I just sentenced this guy 25 years to life, um, and now he's in the mixing pot, right? Like, so we do have serious offenders that get mixed in to the less serious crimes. That being said, when we talk about jails from detention centers, inmates tend to be poor and they cannot make bail. We'll discuss why bail is such a huge issue. They tend to be young and they tend to be uneducated. Right? And what we've seen is not only a significant increase in the number of inmates since 1970s, but an exponential increase in the number of inmates since the 1970s. Because just as the feds passed more laws, the states got tough and the states passed more laws and the states ratcheted up um, sentences, 
uh, possible sentences you could get, right? It was it it it, it was kind of this get tough on crime movement that and in, in reality we're seeing just didn't work. So here is the New York State prison map. Uh, there are a few hubs, right? And you can see where the hubs are. There is an Elmira hub, right? Um, because in Elmira, we have a the, the reception facility, right? So if you get arrested in, in the Elmira hub somewhere, you come to Elmira first for processing, right? They take your picture, your photo, your, your fingerprints, and they decide what prison to send you to, right? Um, so that's the reception center. In addition, you have a maximum security prison on the hill, right? So Elmira's maximum security prison, which actually isn't represented on here. And Elmira's, well, technically in Elmira, um, Southport's maximum security prison, right? So um, I live in Southport. It takes me seven minutes to get to my office. There's another maximum security prison here. Um, it's largely underground, which is really odd. Um, so they have one on the hill and then one kind of buried in the, in the, in the ground. Um, but that's how, we, how it looks, right? And so the idea is, generally speaking, generally speaking, we try to keep you in the hub, right? And the idea is that way you're close to your family, they can visit. We know that family visitation is very good on recidivism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we also realize that you know, we have certain needs, um, like Manhattan. Manhattan, kind of in Staten Island, um, they can't have prisons in them, right? It's just, it just, it, it would make sense in terms of, of finances, right? So they get generally sentenced, sent to somewhere else, um, usually in the Greenhaven Hub um, or the Sullivan Hub. So they, they stay in the region, right? And so Elmira is kind of interesting because we're right, we, we encompass two regions. Right, so we encompass the Western region and the Central New York region. And because of that, the, the reception center on the, on the hill does a lot of business. So if you ever see a purple van drive through the middle of campus, and that van on the very back has a yellow sticker, and that sticker has uh, some letters, like two letters and two numbers, that person, that, that van is transporting a prisoner to the hub or to the, to, to, to the, to the hill. Um, they come right through the middle of campus. It's great. So just because our colors are purple and gold doesn't mean that those guys are uh, ground crews. It means that they're prison guards taking somebody to a maximum security prison. So hopefully that helps you sleep better at night. Now, let's look at the difference between prisons and state populations, right? So if we look at federal prisons, right? Federal prisons, 53.2% of people in federal prison are there for drugs. State prisons, 52.1% of people are there for violent crimes. Right? So people that we probably would want to put away from violent crimes. If we compare that to the federal system, there's only 9.4% of people in the federal system there for violent crimes. When it comes to property offenses, that represents about 20.8% in states and only 5.7% in feds. Public order offenses, 7% in states, 6% in feds. Um, the feds also have to deal with weapons. So that's 13.8%. That's like a felon owning a gun. Um, so that, that makes up that population. And the feds also deal with immigration, right? So at any given time, we have somebody incarcerated um, for immigration offenses or awaiting deportation or something like that. Uh, it's about 11.1%. Now, you see there's 0.9% other and 0.5% other. So what they don't really tell you on this map, and this, this, this map hasn't updated in a little while, um, is a large number of people in the federal system, 
right? This demographic has changed a little bit. Most of them are still there for drugs, but the other category has opened up quite a bit. And usually we're talking for federal offenses, sex offenses um, come up large part in federal prosecutions and states can, I mean, they have state prosecutions. Like, so if you do a, so if you commit a rape, um, you're probably going to be arrested by the state. If you commit a rape at a federal campground or a U.S. government-owned campground, then you're going to be prosecuted by the feds. Right? If you looked at child pornography, well, you're probably going to be prosecuted by the feds because that crosses state lines, whereas states, that's more difficult for them to deal with. So what we've seen is actually an increase in the number of, quote, other offenses. Um, specifically when in regards to sex offenses. Now, again, this is why you want to be, especially if you're a sex offender, because they're not, like, they're the, there are targets when they get to prison. This is why you want to be in federal prison, right? Because 53.2 of them are there for drugs. Violent, only 9.4%. If you're a sex offender in federal prison, state prison, 52.1% are there for violent offenses, right? So, again, it's just, it's, it, it, it it's, it's interesting that we have a very large sector, large dynamics in both, um, but they are so different. So if we look at types of institutions, both at the federal and state level, jails and prisons are called, what's called total institutions, in that they erect barriers to social interchange with the world through a tightly scheduled sequence of activities imposed by a central authority. So generally, these institutions are organized to protect the community against the criminals. Though correction officers view their job as just to keep the inmates safe from each other. Now, I've had speakers come in before who work on the Hill, and they say their job is not to protect the community, their job is not to protect other inmates from being attacked. Their job is to protect other correctional officers. And when I'm disagreed with them, they don't get happy. Um, but theoretically, that's what the correctional officer is there for, is to ensure the safety of every prisoner, regardless of their crime, right, regardless of who they are or their status, to ensure everyone is safe and that everyone is following the rules. And the rules are promulgated upon safety, right? And some reformation trying to bring back people to society, but it, it, it's, it's just to basically gain obedience, make sure everyone's safe and following the rules. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily about protecting other prison guards. Though some think it is, and that's scary, right? Um, because inmates are, what's considered a vulnerable population, right? So if you wanna do scientific studies, or if you wanna even do a survey of prisoners, you have to go through an institutional review board, and you have to also get approval from the state or the feds or whomever. You have to go through an institutional review board, and they have to say, well, you are dealing with people who are the most vulnerable people in society, right? Because they don't have any recourse. So we look and make sure that everything on your survey is on the up and up, can't be misinterpreted. We make sure that people know their, service, their thing is voluntary and that if they take it, they won't get out sooner or they won't get out later. It doesn't matter. Um, they're, they're vulnerable populations. So uh, if we treat them from, as vulnerable populations from an academic standpoint, officers should treat them the same, right? They're vulnerable. Um, now, I shouldn't say that like, if an officer is, is getting hurt that the other officer shouldn't respond, absolutely not. Um, but just with the view of what is my job when I walk in there that day, right? And again, this will differ depending on different correctional officers that you ask, um, just based upon their training, their experience. So that being said, we have the levels of total institutions from the most total institution, most severe to the least severe. So we have super maximum security prisons, maximum security prisons, medium security prisons, minimum security prisons, and 
was called Open Institutions. So this is the federal supermax prison in Colorado, right? Um, there's not that many inmates there. Just so you know, like it looks huge. And it is a very big complex, but there's not that many inmates. Um, but this is where it's at, right? Um, the only people allowed to have weapons or guns are the people who are in the towers. Uh, and if you're climbing a fence, they can shoot and kill you. Doesn't matter if you weren't there for a death sentence or not, like they can just kill you um, if you escape. That being said, notice in the background, if you escape somehow miraculously, which you can't, because we're talking like doors that are like three feet thick concrete, like that open and close in certain times. And I mean, like it's a crazy system. But if you were able to escape somehow, not get shot, where the fuck are you going to go? <laughs> like, all they have to do is put up a helicopter in the sky and see the guy running on the friggin' desert. And I'm like, oh, uh, but that was him. Um, so yeah, that, that's why we chose that location for the Federal Supermax Prison. And this is what the Federal Supermax Prison looks like, all right? So this theoretically is one of the most secure or not the most secure prisons in the world, right? So you're looking at the most secure prison in the world. Never had escape, never had escape attempts to my knowledge. Um, because they don't leave their cell. They don't have human contact. Like, there's nothing to escape from. There's no opportunity. So their, their, their mail gets screened. Stuff gets pulled out of their mail. They're not allowed packages. I mean, it's, 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 it's a very, very serious, serious place. Um, it's a very scary place. And even for the worst of the worst, it's a very scary place. Now, we ratchet that back down to what most of us consider, this is up on the hill and in Southport, maximum security prisons. This is what the interior looks like. But you just see like cell after cell after cell after cell after cell, and they're huge. Prisons are giant places because they house so many people. When I think of the college. The college is a fairly large campus but it only has so many students, right? The prisons have a lot more people. So you have a lot of people that you're trying to direct and control. Uh, you have the centralized tower. Now, generally speaking, in the centralized tower, they may or may not have firearms. Usually they're gonna have less lethal devices. So they're gonna have uh, guns that shoot rubber bullets and things like that to break up any fights. They dispense, and this is true if you go on the, the, the penology tour, uh, they have different like vents and holes in the walls to dispense um, pepper spray, right? To stop riots and things along those lines with other officers getting touched by it. Uh, so it's a very interesting place, but you can see maximum security prison. Here's the interior. Uh, this one actually just has bars. Most, a lot of them have doors, like regular doors, but they have a giant window. And the idea is you don't get any privacy, right? And these cells are usually 10 by 10, right? So 100 square feet. They house at least two prisoners, if not more due to overcrowding. There is a toilet and two metal beds and a 10 by 10 cell. Um, so idea of privacy, idea of using the bathroom, anything like that, that just goes out the window. Um, it's, it, again, total institution. They tell you when you can eat, when you can't eat, right? They'll open your door when you can eat. Uh, they'll tell you how long you have to eat, like seven minutes in some states. Um, then they'll slam the door shut. Then they'll tell you uh, you can go to the recreation yard, which is just a yard or a gym. Um, for an hour, and then they bring you back and slam the door shut, right? So again, they're very, very controlled movements in maximum security prisons. There's not a lot of prisoner engagement. And generally speaking, if we can avoid it, we try not to let the prisoners go outside. We try to keep everything internal. If you go up on the hill, most of the prison is internal, but the jobs that they do and the rec yard 
Um, you have to go outside and they have to go back inside. So they do have um, prisoners on the outside going back inside. Um, but most institutions try to keep it all in one place. Now compare that to this. This is a medium security prison, right? So you see that there's some kind of orientation or there's some kind of class that's going on. The prisoners are all there. There's a couple security guards or there's a couple guards and they're kind of just relaxing, right? They're just leaning on the TV. Um, you can see on the tables, there's chess and there's checkers, backgammon. Uh, this is medium security, right? Here, we're encouraging more socialization because theoretically here, you have less serious offenders or offenders who are very serious, but have shown that they are model inmates and they come from maximum security to medium security. Very rarely will you ever have a supermax go to a max or a, a medium security. Supermax, just, that's kind of where you stay. But smacks, you could, if you show that you are a legitimately trying to reform, good prisoner, you're doing everything you're told, you might get sent down to mat, a minimum, or medium. You can see here there's a lot more freedom, right? So I mean, look at, look at the, the men in this picture. They're not cuffed. They're talking. Um, the lady at front's talking. She doesn't have any guards just, like surrounding her. Um, they, it looks like they have a TV, right? They have bulletin boards. There are telephones on the poles. I mean, the, there's a lot more freedom here than in this, the maximum security prison, right? Where all you had were the cells and <laughs> that was it. Here, we encourage people to kind of be out in the open and, and, and engage and interact. Now, this is still medium security. So we still keep an eye because we're like, well, fights could still happen here. Things could be bad, whatever. Um, one thing I meant to note too, and this is true medium security as well, is you will have a section of maximum security, and supermax they might, I don't know, they have, they have a se section for it, but uh, max they will, and medium they certainly will have a section um, called protective housing, right? So protective housing is where people go when they are being targeted by other prisoners, right? And what protective housing is, is kind of really cruddy. It's basically solitary confinement. <laughs> um, so if you're a sex offender, like you want to get into protective custody. Right, I mean, like that, that is your first thing you want to do is get a protective custody. Because that means they're taking you to the row of cells or the hall of cells where everyone else there is in protective custody, probably because they're sex offenders, right? Now they do get to interact and they have their own section and it kind of looks like this picture here, um, but they're a little bit more constrained, right? Um, they're monitored, but uh, solitary confinement is a big problem, and we'll talk about it in one of our debate days, uh, because it is statistically shown to exacerbate any existing mental health conditions, which most prisoners present with significant mental health conditions, um, or it's even caused, I mean, it's caused people to develop mental health conditions, and it's caused some people to commit suicide, try to commit suicide, um, I mean, the, just total disembodiment. I mean, it's 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 a really it's really barbaric uh, when you can't have contact with somebody else, right? And the thing about the supermax prisons, they don't really allow tours, so who knows what goes on there. So this is a minimum security prison, the interior of a minimum security prison. So as you'll see. There are just rows of beds, three tall, right? And this is in either the feeding hall or the gymnasium. Um, so what a lot of minimum security prisons do is they have cells. Um, if you have a cell, you're lucky. Uh, but because there are so many prisoners and we don't have enough prison space, 
it becomes a problem, right? So think about this. Uh, last, in the last 10 years, California has built like 13 new prisons and they've built one new college, right? So that's just how, how insane our, our priorities are and how rapidly we're growing in terms of corrections versus educational institutions, right? So most people are probably gonna get sent here, um, especially if, you, if you're there for just a short amount of time, like you're gonna get a minimum security prison, um, you know, still more than a year, but basically what you have is what you see. You have three cots, you have some tables that you can play cards at or whatever. Um, there are security guards randomly, if I can find one, um, walking around. The idea here is like, and, and it's interesting, it's because you're right on top of each other. Like literally, there are three high. Um, so if somebody like gets into a fight, the whole thing's gonna explode. And prison guards know this, right? So they try everything they can to put different gangs, different sections, to put, you know, whatever in, in different places like that. It's very strategic where they place people in terms of if they get a cell, if they get a, a, a bed, um, which bed they get, et cetera. It's decided by the correctional officers, the correctional staff, because you are in this confined space, right? And nothing says, let's get into a barroom brawl, like being bored for a year and somebody's saying something derogatory towards you, you're taking a swing and then suddenly everybody jumps in, right? So that's what guards do not want to happen. Um, so they're very careful about who they place, where they place, et cetera. Now, what's been interesting is how this has worked with COVID. So I'm working on a piece right now dealing with prisoners and COVID, uh, but what we've seen is Many prisoners have died from COVID because uh, they are vulnerable populations. They have other diseases, they have other things. COVID has run through prisons like crazy, right? Because you have setups like this, right? If one person in this room gets COVID, I guarantee you every other person in that room is gonna get COVID, right? I mean, it's just kind of how the way things work. Um, but this is minimum security. This is usually the goal. Of people. So you can actually go down from max to medium to minimum. But usually it's going to be medium to minimum, right? And sometimes the judge will sentence you to a minimum security prison, will specify minimum security. And here the idea is yeah, there's not really that much security. There's no guards, there's no bars, and no nothing, but um, you're still confined. You can't leave. Uh, there's no air conditioning. That's why there's a giant fan there. Um, and so all the guys have their shirts off and whatnot. It's not a good place to be by any means, but it's better than we saw the, saw, or the, the, the maximum security prison. Now, the feds have one level down from minimum security. You can actually go down from minimum security. You can make it to a federal prison camp. This is a picture of a federal prison camp. Look how high that wall is. That's it. Like, that's it. That's all they have. Um, if you get to a federal prison camp, generally, it's going to be kind of like you saw in the other one, bunk beds. Um, there's going to be less of them because it's the feds. They're going to be nicer because it's the feds. And what you do is they, your day is packed, right? You go to job training. In the morning, in the afternoon, you go to education, and then you work in the prison doing whatever job you have to do, and your day is filled. Now, what's interesting is a lot of prison camps, the back door is open. Like if, if prisoners need to step outside, like they allow smoking at federal prison camps. So if a prisoner needs to step outside to smoke, he just goes outside and smokes. Because you've basically proved yourself so worthy that like you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna run. And if you get in a prison camp, you're not gonna run. Like this place, these things are not nice by any means, but they are the least terrible. Um, so we know you're not gonna run. There's no reason to have high barbed wire fences. There's no reason to have guns and guard towers, right? Um, we just know you're not going to. Because why would you? 
Because if you run, you're going to get put into a maximum security prison when we catch you. And you get into a prison camp, and prison camps are nice. Um, so yeah, it, it's the prisoners kind of have, a, I mean, they have virtually complete freedom with the exception of being able to leave the grounds. All right, they can't leave the grounds, but they can do whatever else they want to do. Now they're still wearing like Department of Corrections shirts and pants and I mean, all that stuff, that doesn't change. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is it, that's as tall as the fence gets, all right? Um, so this is kind of the goal of, if you're a federal prisoner serving definitely a long time, this is the goal. If you're a federal prisoner who is serving a short sentence, you might get put into the prison camp. It just depends. Um, so basically all federal prisoners go to Oklahoma City um, when space opens up in Oklahoma City. In Oklahoma City, they do all kinds of testing. Right? They do psychological testing. They do um, personality testing. They do all kinds of these tests. And then they assign you a classification, right? So they assign you medium or maximum, medium, minimum, or prison camp. And then you wait in Oklahoma in solitary confinement until a bed opens up in whatever classification you're in. And then you are taken by bus or via Con Air or even sometimes just a van to the prison. And then you booked into the prison and then you're a prisoner. Right, so if it's a really low level, stupid offense, um, even the judge thinks it's dumb, they'll specify prison camp. If it's really low level, in Oklahoma City, they'll say prison camp, um, especially if they don't have any violent background and there's nothing like sex related. Like, they, it was just something that was stupid, like you killed a squirrel on federal land or something. Like, we're going to sentence you to prison camp. Um, the idea here is you're still being punished, right? You can't leave, so your freedom is still restricted. But the success rate of these places is insane, right? So actually, the the more you go up in terms of security, the more likely it is that person is going to reoffend. So we know that federal prison camps, most of those people aren't coming back, right? Like they are done. Like nope, not doing it, and they haven't even seen the bad parts, right? Now, things do happen at prison camps, right? So it's usually just fist fights break out. Two, two prisoners trying to be tough and they break out into a fist fight. They're very rarely stabbings or shankings in, in, in um, prison camps. But prisoners don't want to ever fight. They don't want to do anything. Like if you go into the there, you be the they will be the nicest people to you. They'll be the most passive. You can go in there and call them any name you want, and they'll just smile. Because if you get into a fight at a federal prison camp, they can send you up all the way up to medium or maximum security, right? So you go from having like this really like complete autonomy to suddenly everything you do is restricted, monitored, and you're in there with a lot of dangerous people. So people who go to prison camp are very grateful to be there. And generally speaking, we don't have that many disciplinary infractions. Like I said, the biggest one's a fist fight. And usually like, if it's not like anybody gets hurt, they don't care. Uh, they'll just say, oh, you have to stay in your bunk for a day, like to ground you. Um, but you know, if you're a persistent offender or you really do hurt somebody, then they move you up the ladder. So just as you can go down the ladder, you can also go up the ladder. Now, this is what I was saying earlier. Um, we're talking about classification. So classification is just a system by which correctional agencies matches, match treatment and security programs with individual offenders and their requirements. Now the goal is to reduce, reduce risk that the inmate poses to institutional operations and to meet the inmate's needs. So this occurs during the intake process. As I said, all federal prisoners go to the Federal Correctional Facility, FTC in Oklahoma City for diagnostic testing and interviews to determine their level of risk to other inmates. And when we look and we see, you know, what's your propensity to escape? Are you gonna be victimized? Do you have gang affiliations? How far did you go in school? We're gonna look at all that, right? How young are you? All that jazz. 
There's actually, uh, I think I have it posted to our website, but I have the classification guide. It's basically like they go through and they give you points. If you meet this, you get this many points, you meet this, you get this many points, and then the points tell you where the person's going, right? The more points they have, the more likely they're going to a higher rank system, higher rank facility, the less points they have, they're going to a low, low risk or low, low um, controlled facility. So that being said, I'll say this with likelihood of victimization, uh, the federal prisons, they erected a federal prison just for sex offenders, right? And the idea here is not, oh, they're gonna sex offend against each other. No, and there, does that happen sometimes? Yeah, but like, that's not the point. The point here is sex offenders are targets everywhere. They're not wanted anywhere, right? They have, they're targets. So they opened up one that was just for sex offenders um, so that they wouldn't be targets. Now there is a hierarchy among sex offenders. Right? People who, who just watch child porn are at the top. People who possessed it are at second. People who distributed it are third. People who made it are like fucking shit bags, right? Like they're, they're the ones who get treated like crap. Um, it's a, it's a really weird system they have. It's really complicated. Uh, but we look at that too, says, is, is there a risk of victimization here? And then the big one, the one that will get you maximum security every time, like you, you could be like the Pope and just break the law, um, but you'll get maximum security every time. Do you have gang affiliation, right? And what we try to do is we try our best to separate gang members as much as we can. But the problem is so they, you know, they don't communicate and they don't like keep running their, their gang from the inside. But there's a problem in that there's more than one gang, right? Like there's hundreds of gangs. And we try to separate them, but that means we're putting rival gangs, rival gangster with an, a rival gangster, right? They're gonna fight, like it's not gonna end well. So gang affiliation will always get you to the maximum where they have the most control. Now, generally speaking, these are assigned by a committee or board based upon these factors. And again, this can change. Your, your classification can change based upon your discipline in prison. So there is no secret here. Um, I am a prison abolitionist. So I thought I'd throw this in. Um, this is actually from your book. Uh, it's Emerging Anti-Incarceration Philosophical Perspectives. Right. So we begin with the notion that incarceration may be unnecessary for some offenders. Right. Um, it can be more detrimental. We've seen that people who go into prison for like a relatively minor crime, maybe it was big, but like it didn't really hurt anyone. Um, they come out worse. They come out more dangerous. Right. We also say it costs less to supervise offenders in the community than to incarcerate them. Right, so we're talking every prisoner in the United States, it costs roughly $28,000 to incarcerate them per year. When they hit age 60 to 65, that number jumps up closer to $100,000 per year, right? because we have to give life-saving medical treatments, all that jazz. So think about your taxes. Where are your taxes going? Your taxes are going to keep these people alive, right? And if we just let them, like if we put them in the community and we said, you know, check in with the probation officer every day, it's a lot cheaper. And it's actually a lot more effective. Now, that being said, there's unfavorable consequences of imprisonment and they may impede rehabilitation and community reintegration. So again, in prison, like you are trained like to not trust anyone, to stay away from big groups, right, to, to always have a weapon on you, and to distrust everyone. You can't trust anyone, right? Never accept a favor, ever. Um, so when you get back into the community, if you still have that mindset, which you will, because you've been in there for years, that's just not gonna end well for anyone, right? Um, you have some people that become so incarcerated, or so, so jail-minded, um, it's, it's, it's institutionalized, it's ridiculous. 
um, they leave the prison after so many years and they find out they cannot make it on the outside, right? They need that. Before they didn't need it, but now they need that supervision. They need somebody telling them, you have to do this, you have to do this. And we actually do see a lot of recently released prisoners committing suicide, right? And it's because they can't function. Like they just can't. Um, so they kill themselves. And that's, again, unfavorable. Now, we also have strategies that may help offenders play productive roles in neighborhoods and communities. So if you're under the watch of a parole officer, if you're under the watch of community supervision, right, you have to do community service. You have to pay back the community. So if you're, let's say, in a really bad part of town, that's where you live, we're going to say you have to clean it up. Right? Clean it up, paint it, all that jazz. That's community service. You're actually doing something as opposed to just sitting there. Uh, reducing and eliminating the period of confinement uh, for a more pragmatic approach. So sentences in the United States are unbelievably disproportionately high than sentences for the same offenses in other countries. So for instance, the, as much as I don't like prisons, I absolutely adore Norway. Norway has probably the most progressive prison system in the world. They also have the most uh, the least, least recidivism rate in the world. Um, they, the maximum sentence you can get in Norway is 20 years in prison. And their idea is we have 20 years to rehabilitate you. Right? Because what you did is so bad that you probably need the 20 years to be rehabilitated. But when you leave, you leave with a job, you leave with a house, you leave, I mean, it's, it's a socialist country, so you, so you leave with a lot of things. Um, prison guards have to have at least a bachelor's in psychology, if not a master's in psychology, to be a prison guard. Um, it's just, it's an amazing approach that they take. And we in the United States, we treat everything with put them in jail put them in jail, put them in jail. Other countries don't do that. <laughs> um, jail is the last resort, right, in corrections. Uh, and it should be, in the United States, considered a last resort, right? Like, well, we've tried everything else, nothing has worked for you, you have to go to prison. Well, that's, if you're talking about a drug dealer, okay, that's fair, right? If you're talking about somebody who just murdered somebody, saying, okay, you got to go clean up the community, probably not going to happen, right? So we got to be pragmatic in our approach and, and understand that sometimes confinement is, well, most of the time, our confinement periods are insanely long compared to other countries. Um, I mean, we, I mean, crazy long. Like they don't understand, like other countries don't understand. Why are you putting people in prison for five years? Like that's a huge deal there. We're like, oh, that's our go-to. <laughs> And at the, federal system, at the federal level, five years is really the go-to um, sentence. Right? That's like the, the probably like the lightest sentence that you can get. Um, I mean, you get lighter ones, but that's the, the most common one is, is five years. Other countries look at that and, and they are astonished, right? Um, and psychologists look at that and they're astonished because of institutionalization. So it, again, when we look at our system, we also have to look abroad to see what do others do what are they doing well? What are they doing poorly? What are we doing well? And most importantly, what are we doing poorly? Right? And so we need to be able to understand and say, okay, we need to change the system when the system is fundamentally broken. And as I've said several times in this course, the criminal justice system in the United States is fundamentally broken. So one thing that we can employ instead of prisons, are diversionary programs, right? So basically it's a diversion is removal of offenders from criminal law at any stage of police or the court process. So basically this is, is diverting or, or making a fin giving them another path. So they don't have to go to court, they don't have to, all that stuff, it gives them another path, right? So this often occurs before they are adjudicated, before they are tried or they plea. Uh, 
Offenders may be supervised by community correctional agencies. They may be supervised by the courts. So one example is drug court. Drug court, if you're, if you just have it on you and you're not, and, and dealing too sometimes, but usually if you just have simple possession, um, we'll divert you to drug court. And drug court is no joke. You get drug tested like every day, you know, you have to report in at certain times, you have to get a job, you have to do all this kind of stuff. And the idea is at the end of it, after you've completed the drug court program, not only do you have job skills, not only do you have employment, not only do you have a place to go, but you also have the support of the drug court. All right, so the judge will applaud, literally applaud, when somebody completes the program. Everyone in the court will applaud because it's such a big deal. A lot of people fail the drug court program and then they go down the traditional adjudication route, right, which can be imprisonment. Drug courts, you're in the community, we put certain conditions on you, you're expected to meet them. If you don't meet them, then we're going to put you back on the trial court, right, and you can go to jail. Um, that being said, arguments in favor of diversion have increased, um, especially considering the prison population. As I said earlier, California is under uh, legal requirements to, re to reduce its prison population significantly. Um, and it's, it's getting there, sort of. But also, I have to understand, it's difficult to assess the value or the impact of diversionary programs. Um, how successful they are versus how successful the person would be if they went to jail, right? It's fairly difficult to assess that. That being said, diversionary programs are popular, especially among judges, because they permit the judge to impose intermediate level sanctions, but avoiding incarcerating offenders, right? So judge says, I'm going to punish you. You got to do this, 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 and this. By this date. That's an intermediate level sanction, right? You go home that night. Like you, you, you go home. Um, that gives the judge an alternative to sending somebody to prison, right? And guiding correctional philosophy in the United States theoretically is, but it's not. Prison should be the last resort, right? Instead, we have an incarceration addiction. We like putting people in prison. So diversionary programs are a little bit hard to, to, to read, but they are very much favored by judges. Most, uh, they're very favored by people, uh, like just random citizens in the community, right? random polling. Um, they're, they're, they're a good alternative. So another example is community service programs. Right, so often this will go hand in hand with diversion. Right, so you won't go, we won't, we won't try you. And the idea behind your court too and diversionary programs is if you complete the diversionary program, your charges go away, right? And you never have to say, I've been convicted or charged of a crime. They just are completely erased, right? So there's an incentive to complete that program. Um, so community service often linked to diversion, right? You'd have to perform X many hours of community service. Now, petty offenders may perform community service in lieu of prosecution or instead of incarceration, right? And the offense is wiped from their record. Um, again, offenders in these programs, they're generally found guilty of lesser crimes um, or, or they've been charged with lesser crimes. So we're talking like vandalism, petty theft, really just minor stuff, right? Where we said, well, you need to be punished. But putting you in jail seems ridiculous. That's disproportionate, right? And theoretically a, a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Um, we're going to make you do community service, right? So you messed up the community by doing what you did. Now you have to go fix it, which isn't always easy. What's interesting is when... Um, I was I was in high school that people who go do community service, the airport had a wait list. 
of people for community service. And this is there's a little tiny airport, not like the one we have here. Like, no, like it was all private planes. So, you know, no no commercial jets flew out of it or anything like that. Um, because what would happen is if you did community service there, you would walk in, you would vacuum the floor, and then you would sit in the tower and listen and watch planes all day. And that was community service, right? So arguably some community service can be effective. Otherwise, sometimes it's not, right? And everybody knew it. It was, a, it was an open secret. They didn't do anything about it, largely because they didn't care, because these were petty offenses, right? Um, if they were more severe offenses and we found out they were just sitting there watching planes, people in society would be pissed. They're like, oh, they spray painted the F word on a building. I don't give a shit, right? Like, doesn't matter to me. Um, they robbed a bank. They're watching airplanes all day. Are you kidding me? Right, so again, there's a kind of humanistic interaction that we have when we link it to community service. Another example of an alternative is home confinement and electronic monitoring. Uh, so home confinement began in an official sanction after electronic monitoring began to be used. So home confinement quickly became popular and it's becoming more and more popular um, because of an increased prison population, right? Prisons are, are bursting at the seams because they have too many people and the development of electronic and digital monitoring, right? So we can tell at any point where you are in society, right? You have a GPS on you. And if you try to mess with the bracelet that's on your foot, and it's like, it's like a little black bracelet, it's got a little bump on it, um, but they put it on your foot, you can't take it off. If you try to tamper with it, to, to try and take it off, it sends a signal to the police, the police come and arrest you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, although it can be annoying. So I was taking a class and two kids over from me, this guy, like I kept hearing beep, Whole class, and finally, the, the 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 teacher was like, "What is going on? What is that?" And the kid is like, "Sorry, that's that's me. Um, I'm technically out of my zone that I'm allowed to be out of, but it's okay. They said I can go to school for it, so that's why it's beeping. It'll beep the whole class. I'm sorry." And yeah, like the rest of the term, he was beeping because he was out of his zone, but the, the probation officers let him be out of his zone to go to go to school. Um, and the idea here is the sanction allows offenders to remain in the community and provide some measure of control to in response from the criminal justice system, right? Um, home incarceration is a safe and effective community sanction for low level offenders. And so again, we're talking like, okay, yeah, they did something bad and that was pretty bad, but prison, that we can do something different, right? That's that kind of feeling. Um, that, that's what we're talking about, home confinement. Now, I will say this, since COVID has happened, uh, people are actually a lot more, it's interesting, they're becoming a lot more in favor of home incarceration or home confinement because they survived COVID for three months when we couldn't leave the house and how like crazy that drives you, like how like you're just like, I, I, I need to do something, I need to get out, whatever. Um, and you, you're not allowed to, right? So people are starting to say, wow, that's almost worse than prison, right? Um, but it allows you to stay there. Um, if you Sometimes it's home confinement where you literally cannot leave your home. Um, I had a case when I worked for the First Circuit uh, and one of the clerks and I got into a very heated and name calling disagreement over this case, but basically what happened is there was a guy in federal home confinement, right? And he goes, he takes a, he, the, the bracelet he wears gives him 30 seconds before it sends an alert to the police to, to you know, the, this person is, is violating what they're supposed to. So in that 30 seconds, he was alleged to have gotten onto a four-wheeler, driven two miles, go into a drug dealer's house, buy drugs, 
get back on the four-wheeler and come back to his house two miles down the road in 30 seconds. My take on the case was like, okay, this is stupid. Like, no, this, this is not factually possible. And the clerk who argued with me, I mean, he was pissed. Like, he sent me this horrible email. He's like, this is ridiculous. Can't believe you think this way. I've been like, just ticked off. And I was like, dude, count. Like, you're a four-wheeler two miles away. Like, 30 seconds. Not, you're not going to be able to do anything in 30 seconds. Um, even starting the four-wheeler will take 30 seconds. And ultimately, the judge agreed with me. So, you know, I went. And that really pissed off the other guy, and that made me even more happy. Um, but it, yeah, it's becoming more and more favorable. Um, sometimes you can't leave the house, like I said, home confinement, or you may be able to leave the house to do certain activities. We'll let you leave the house to go grocery shopping. We'll let you leave the house to go to church. We'll leave, let you leave the house to go to school. We'll let you to leave the house to go to work. But as soon as it's over, you have to report back by this time, by this time, by this time, right? And we can check to make sure that you're at work at any given time. And they can. Probation and parole officers can pull up a map and it shows every single bracelet, what they're, what they're doing at what time. Um, and again, if you try to tamper with it, if you try to like cut it off or you try to like get out of it, sometimes if it gets wet, that's the problem. But sometimes if it gets wet, like it'll go off um, as being tampered with. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting situation um, because COVID has kind of forced people to live the reality of, wait, home confinement isn't cushy. Like we always say, like home confinement. Oh, that's a joke. No, it kind of sucks, right? Like, and it's definitely better than prison, but like, how much better? Um, so you know, that just kind of led us to like, I think more people are, are going to be thinking along those lines in terms of home confinement, right? What it, what does it actually mean to them? So next class, we are going to look at life on the inside of correctional facilities. What it's like to be a prisoner. If you have any questions, always feel free to email me. Beyond that, have a great day.